Mr. Pond Balls, tell me what to do to make all my Lunker Lake dreams come true. Hello everybody, Bob Lusk coming at you live from the RV. So, uh, well, I don't know what it's like where you are, but I'm sitting in an oven. <laughs> I turned the air conditioner on this thing. I actually had my son Jonathan where it's parked at, at his ranch there out between Brenham and Navasota in Washington County, Texas. Had him uh, come in and turn the thermostat down to 75 yesterday. And when I got air, I kicked it down to about 48, except it only goes to 60. Well, this morning it was nice and cool, but these dadgum things are kind of like an oven. So it's it's pretty warm in here, and I bet you it's pretty warm where you are. I know this. Uh, with La Nina doing what La Nina does, we're going through a pretty hot spell, which is not unusual. About every 10 years where we are. You know, it's where the, where the, the jet stream kind of dips down, and, and people in the Midwest and Northeast, they get higher than average rainfalls and and moderate temperatures typically typically where we get scalding hot you know and then have these wildfires that make the news but you kind of got to expect it let's see who's going on here john funk i bet you're still pretty hot up there buddy john pearson troy todd scott scott's get to hang out live come on scott that's great buddy money with dell troy todd i'm scrolling up here Yep, yep. Hey, you guys, there's David Schneiderman. Hey, David, I got to walk out on an easy dock yesterday over there for Cornelius near Eustis, Texas. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit today. I'm going to talk about the dock, but I'm also going to talk about the pond and the goals a little bit. Um, you guys know the drill. Hashtag Pond Boss Magazine in the comment section. Click like or the little heart thing. Oh, look at that. I'm going to line up with my nose. Yep, yep. And... Uh, Share this to your timeline and you're eligible for a drawing for a Palm Boss hat and something else cool. I think we still have one or two uh, cool coolers that David Schneiderman threw at us for a drawing. So as a matter of fact, we're going to do that. I'm going to talk to Leanne tomorrow for next Monday night. We'll have a drawing for a Palm Boss hat and a Palm Boss, not a Palm Boss, but an Easy Dock little cooler. So if you guys will do those three things. Hashtag Palm Balls Magazine in the little comment section. Click heart or like or something other than the grouchy face thing. And share this to your timeline. You'll be eligible for that drawing for next week. So uh, I got a number of topics I want to pitch out at you and hope that this internet connection stays good. Actually, you know what? I bypassed the internet here because it's so dead gum slow. I've got one bar on my dead gum. Um, AT&T phone. There's Dustin Crawley. Yep. Scott took off early? Dude, what's going on? What's the matter with you, boy? What are you thinking? Wesley Ellis. Good. Richard Williams. Good to see Richard. Alright, so here we go. If you guys have questions, pitch them to me. And of course, you know, here's part of my deal. Palm Boss Magazine. $35 a year. Cheaper than a Friday night date, and it lasts a year. And I promise you, each issue... It's got nuggets in there that you can use. Uh, I was talking to Mark McDonald today, the founding editor of Palm Boss Magazine, and we were kind of just uh, looking in the rearview mirror as to what's happened over the last 30 years of the magazine. He he was with us until 2004, so I guess he's been gone longer than he was here. So what was that, 16, 18 years ago? Out of, so he had it for the first 12. I took it over after that. But um, he's just amazed that it's, it's lived this long. But, you know, with, with this audience... And one thing I was telling him, it's not unusual for us to get a call from somebody, um, gosh, way up in their 70s, uh, early 80s. Uh, several folks have called me just in the last couple of years said, you know what, Bob, I've got a whole bunch of back issues at Pond Boss. I don't really want to throw them away. Would you guys like to have them? And then you can do something with them. Well, yeah, people keep them as a reference. So it's just a magazine. Oh, no, wait, it's not. It's, it's years and years of writer's experiences. There's some theory, there's some um, science-backed data, there's lots of opinions and a lot of experience that goes into every article in this magazine. So, 35 bucks. If you've got a pond, it's worth it. Go to pondboss.com, click on subscribe, and you can subscribe to this little jewel of a magazine. 
So there's the commercial to start off with. That took up five minutes. Hello, Billy Bates from Maryland. Good to see you, buddy. So you guys start throwing some questions at me. But what I thought I'd talk about tonight, I called the girls earlier today. And, geez, hello, Mike. Mike Chico Garcia, my longtime good buddy, friend, and our videographer that, who, uh, that man, I'm telling you what, he is Chico. You guys have seen Chico on this show before. That is one of the most gifted, talented people I've ever met. And he's down to earth. He's humble. He, uh, he's a great musician and a great videographer and an outstanding video editor. You know, and if you don't believe me, go look at some of the videos at the Institute of Higher Pondology. Yeah. Go to pondboss.com, click on the Institute of Higher Pondology tab, and it'll take you there. Chico, how's that segue? You're going to be proud of me. I know, dude. I got it. So, um, I called the girls a little bit earlier, and, and then just kind of, uh, just I looked looked back, looked at the little intro they put in. Irascible? What the hell does that mean? Never even looked that word up. But if they said it, I must be, whatever that is. Hello, Clayton Porter. Good to see you, buddy. You know how to play the game. So, what I thought I'd talk about today is some of the consequences or some of the competition that goes on in your pond with um, hot water. Now, you know, a lot of us, so we don't really think about what's going on in a pond when the water's scalding hot like this. Uh, I'm going to tell you a couple of stories. Uh, I graduated from college in December of 1979, hung out a shingle, went to work, started a little business, and I leased a fish farm right out of college. What the hell was I thinking? You know, I leased a fish farm. It was 2100 bucks a month. Expecting there was inventory, which there wasn't. Expecting there was a marketplace, which there wasn't. So my learning curve was sitting on the back of a credit line that took me eight years to pay back after I left. So, uh, but here's what happened. 1980 was the harshest summer I can remember on record. Now, thank goodness I was 24 years old at the time, so I was able to kind of weather that, you know, 24, 25 through there somewhere. Christopher Aguilar from South, Al South Lu LA, Louisiana, LA. Samuel Jenkins, how do I build an overflow for a heavy 20 gallon per minute spring fed pond? Um, there's several ways you can do that. It's two acres. Let's see, two acres. Let's see here. You know, I'll get back to that story here in a minute. How do I build an overflow for a heavy 20 gallon per minute spring fed pond? Um, I do that with a pipe. I think a three inch pipe is more than big enough. Put it in the low spot close to the uh, spillway. Put it at where you want the pond level to be. Bury it. Run it down way beyond the backside toe of the dam and let it flow down the creek. And one thing that would be even better is if you could turn inside when you run the pipe through the dam and you get it buried, put a 45 degree elbow on it right there where it just joins the inside slope of the dam and run another pipe, three inch pipe, down around seven or eight feet. That way you're not sucking out the spring water, you're sucking out the water that's, that's most likely to be uh, stagnant, anoxic, toxic, cold, and doesn't have any... Uh, benefit to the pond. Yep, daddy's here. That's it. Yeah, Justin, my daddy, my father says 19. It was awful. It was awful. It was. It was hard. You know, I'm just thankful I was stupid because I didn't know how hard it was. You know, when you're 24, 25 years old and you got a wife and two young kids and you're trying to scratch out a living and you don't know what you're doing, it's a whole lot less painful, even though it was painful because it was hot. Uh, that's when I learned that a central heat and air conditioning unit, its its mission is to get the temperature 20 degrees cooler than the hot part of the day or whatever the temperature is. Well, back then, during that span of time, if I remember right, I have to go back and look at the records, but I think we had something like 90, 90 straight days over 100 degrees in Wichita Falls, Texas. 90. And it might have been more than that. But what I remember is it started in May, and then out of those 90 days, there were about 10 of them that were 110 or hotter. And there were three or four that were 115. And there were, out of those three or four, two of those were 117 degrees. Our house 
just a little small three bedroom house on that fish farm cooled down to 92 degrees. It was miserably hot. And the only place we could find anywhere was to go to Sykes Center Mall in Wichita Falls, Texas, or the library. And there were a couple of places in Sykes Center Mall and at the library where we could go sit and be cool for a little bit. You couldn't even get in the ponds. The ponds were hot tub hot. There were 100. Because when it's 117 degrees at night, the temperature might get down to 95, 94, 93. But we're going through a similar hot snap like that right now. So, uh, you know, to, I'm, I'm down uh, in Washington County at Running River Ranch at my son and daughter-in-law's place. They've got a big event coming up tomorrow, and we're here to help them. But uh, uh, the temperature here today was like 104. Up along the Red River, 108. Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex, 109. Kansas City, triple digits. Nashville, Tennessee, scalding hot. You know, Iowa, hot. So in the Midwest, Southeast, South, it's steaming hot. So what happens to our ponds when the temperature gets hot? There's a lot of things competing with each other. Let's see here. I'm going to scroll down a little bit and see, make sure I don't miss anything. Danny Mac, dang it, a nine-minute forget. Good evening, Bob. I pray you're not in, yeah, we're, we're, you know, we're not in the nearby fires, but we are sure are paying attention to those fires because they're not far from where we live around Granbury. You know, up at Possum Kingdom, that's about 90 miles away from us. The ones out at Chalk Mountain, that's 25 miles away, blowing away from us. But when you've got this kind of temperature with humidity around 10 to 18 to 20 percent, things are going to burn. It's just, it's just inevitable. The grid is going to be tested. You know, the the temperatures are hot. But what goes on with your pond? Let's 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 talk about that just for a minute. The uh, the number one thing is whatever's living in it is doing the best they can to survive. And they survive sometimes competitively. And so let's kind of break that down. What, what do I mean by surviving competitively? Let's just start with the water. You know, the warmer water is, its affinity for oxygen drops. So when we've got water temperatures in surface temperatures in the mid 90s which Danny Mac if your pond wasn't being circulated the top of your pond would be 92 93 degrees just just right somewhere in the middle between the between the morning low and the afternoon high and in that hot water there's things that prefer to grow in it and things that prefer not to grow in it and I'm talking mostly about algae blooms I'm talking about blue-green algae. I'm talking about golden algae. Golden algae doesn't like hot water. Uh, the healthy types of algae don't like hot water, but blue-green algae thrives in it. So it goes. there's an advantage that goes to blue-green algae and the harmful algal blooms this time of year simply because the water's hot. And they can, if they've got all the conditions, if they've got the right level of phosphorus, if they've got the right imbalance, imbalance, word between phosphorus and nitrogen then that harmful algal bloom aka blue green algae or planktonic algae is going to grow and thrive so as it grows and thrives it's consuming space it's consuming nutrients it's consuming oxygen at night even though even though it's a bacteria it can still produce oxygen during the daytime because part of the community of a harmful algal bloom is phytoplankton that we might not like but can still photosynthesize and respire at night. So while it's consuming oxygen and the, the, the water communicating with the atmosphere is absorbing oxygen, water's affinity for oxygen drops. So right now when it's hot, we're at one of the highest risk times of the year for an oxygen depletion. So with that in mind, what's the next level? You've got aquatic plants. You've got um, floating aquatic plants. You've got submerged aquatic plants, emerged aquatic plants. You know, so all those plants are competing for space, competing for nutrients, and trying not to die because it's so hot. You know, all the while, nature is saying, you know what, we're going to take this water away from you because the humidity is 10%, the temperature is 105, and evaporation rates are as high as they're ever going to get. Those evaporation rates right now in Texas, Oklahoma, parts of Arkansas, some in Missouri, and then moving to the east 
evaporation rates can be as much as half an inch a day. There's some areas where people claim that the evaporation are, rates are higher than that. But if you look at that, over a 12-day period, your pond's going to drop six inches. You know, over a month, it's going to drop a foot. And with projections as they are now, it won't surprise me if we get to the end of September with minimal rainfall events that a lot of your ponds have dropped two to three feet just through evaporation. Now, let's think about that. One of the things that you, you got to know is, is a typical pond, the top three to four feet, is the same volume of water as the entire rest of the pond. And when you think about that, and, and you think about a three to one slope, if it's sloped properly, and you think about how much water, a pond's not necessarily cone shaped, but it is bowl shaped, typically, you know, and, and if, if, if you worked with me to design it, it's never bowl shaped. But if you think about that in theory, the top three to four feet that amount of water is the same as what's going as what you've got stored below that depth depending on how deep the water is so when you get half the volume of water that evaporates over a 90 day period think about what happens to the water chemistry so knowing that the water is the universal solvent and things that can dissolve into water will your water's already already dissolved as many minerals as it can so think about Lake Mead. You've seen pictures of Lake Mead, you know, over there on the Colorado River outside of uh, that little old Sin City, what, Las Vegas, Nevada, or somewhere like that. When you look at the rocks as that lake is dropped, they're coated in white. That's limestone. So most lakes, most ponds around have dissolved some sort of minerals, some sort of organic matter. Well, as the water evaporates, the only thing that leaves is the water. So anything that's dissolved into the water stays behind. So let's do a little bit of just simple math. So you've had, um, by the end of September, half your water has evaporated. So that means that everything that was dissolved into that water has doubled. You've got twice the alkalinity. You've got twice the hardness. You've got twice the phosphorus. You've got twice the nitrogen. Unless something is, uh, is using that. You know, so the nitrogen and the phosphorus are probably not going to go unused while the alkalinity can. So what happens is that's when you start seeing these mega algal blooms, especially the harmful ones. So now is the time that you need to be paying attention to that sort of thing with your pond. You know, the fish, uh, your cool water fish, smallmouth bass, walleye, yellow perch, pumpkin seeds, you know, for you folks that are in Iowa, Illinois, Michigan, John Funk, you guys, um, Billy Bates in Maryland, you're not going to be as impacted by the heat as we are in the south, you know, but you're still going to see warmer than normal temperatures, and those cool water fish are jockeying for position, they're jockeying in the food chain. Spawning is pretty well stopped. It's happened. Now, everything is trying to survive, and those things that can thrive are fighting to compete for their food and for their space. So now that's why I'm talking about harmful algae, algae algal, just washed my tongue and I can't, I'm going to, harmful algal blooms. <laughs> you know, so your warm water fish, you know, they're warm water fish. They're not scalding ass hot water fish. They don't like it. You know, largemouth bass, when the water temperature hits 87 or 88, they can die from that because that's just too hot. That's outside their range. You know, so now what's going on with your fish in, in, the, in your ponds is they're trying to find the best thermal refuge they can find. They're not as interested in biting your hook. However, you guys, somebody's going to email me and say, well, I caught 10 bass today. Well, good. They had to be hungry at some point, so they're going to bite. But I know this. If you catch a bass and you drag it through that 92-degree water at the top, even though you caught it 12 feet deep, and you throw it right back down in that hot ass water, if it don't seek its thermal refuge, you're gonna see it floating on top of the water in two days. You know, so I'm telling you that, it's, it's, that, that right now is a very stressful time. Now, uh, uh, I, I got a text from a guy yesterday, uh, Jeff, who's a friend of mine, and he said, hey, as hot as it is, I was talking to one of my buddies, should we, should we buy an aeration system? No, if, if you don't have an aeration system, don't go get one right now. 
And then I don't care if you buy one now, if you find a good deal, just don't use it. Because what's going on is your pond is doing the best it can to create an equilibrium in dire circumstances. If if Jeff were to put a pond, on, I mean an aeration system on his quarter acre pond, he'd kill every fish in it. You know, now if you want to buy a water circulator and, and move water horizontally, you can do that. But don't don't try to go get an aeration system and kick it in gear if you don't have one. So we got to get through this harsh part of the summer. Uh, Ron Ardois sent me a Ron Ardoin. God dang it, Lus. I know he's watching. He sent me a picture of a client of his that uh, called somebody to come in with a helicopter and spray lotus pads. He didn't talk to Ron about it. So he's, I don't know how many acres, he probably sprayed 15 acres of, 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 a, of a lotus pads on a 40 acre piece of a reservoir. And now they're all dead. So Ron knowingly called the guy after he saw the pictures and said, you know what, you need to drain about a foot of water off that reservoir and thank goodness it's an old catfish farm converted to a fishing lake and kick the well on and spit some fresh water in there because you're going to have plants decomposing so rapidly that you're ultimately going to have water quality issues. So, yeah, Boudin, Ardoin, Boudin. I, you know, every time I think of that, Ardo, Ardoin, Ardoin. <laughs> I love you. You're pretty freaking patient with me. All right, so I'm going to back up just a little bit here because I'm, I'm, I'm kind of barking all this stuff here. R.E. Thompson, day off, and he got my eight yards mode. Shut up. Dude, you're like 130 years old. R.E. Thompson, I don't know, 83, 80, 81. He's 81 years old. In Mississippi, he mowed eight yards. It's Wednesday. He normally goes and helps people that are in rehab at the, with through his church, you know, but he took the day off because he mowed eight yards, dude. I'm going to play my little bitty fiddle. I'm so proud of you, dude. It's just you're freaking amazing. I don't know how you do it, but that's probably why you're 81 years old. Yes, it was hot. Two questions. Should I be running my diffusers at night or daytime? Then I think Dan said bass quit eating at 87.5 degrees. That's true. Um, 87 and a half degrees is, is really too hot. So with your diffusers, I would be running them. What I normally tell people is to put them on a timer Run them from 9 at night till 9 in the morning. I'm changing that with these circumstances. Run them from midnight to about 8 in the morning. Now, if you'll do that, what you'll do is you'll mitigate uh, respiration and you won't make the water so hot. Now, I do have an 8-acre lake that's under management in Mississippi where they're running them from midnight to 8. And the water temperature is like 85 or 86 degrees top to bottom. That's still too hot, but they can't do anything about it. You know, it's either that or don't run the aeration system. I know this. If they ran that aeration system 24-7, that water temperature would be 88, 89, 90, and they'd be calling me because some of their best bass would be dying, even though the lake's only three years old. So, yes, yes, uh, yes, when Bill Dance says that the bass quit eating at 87.5, that's true. It doesn't have to be 87.5, 87, 88, 89, they're done. All they're trying to do is not die. So that's what's going on with him. Um, speaking of Bill Dance, I got to know him years ago, and I still have his cell number. Whoa, makes me a big deal, don't it? But um, uh, where I met him face to face, it was pretty fun. I got to go. Ray Scott invited me to go to the Bassmasters Classic in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, at Three Rivers, like in 2005, maybe. Well, I've, I've always been a big Bill Dance fan. You know, love his shows, love his techniques. Watched him even when I was, you know, young in my 20s. I think he's 76 or 77 now. And uh, I walked into the hotel. Uh, I, I was working in upstate New York at the time for a couple of weeks a month. And at that point, I'd driven up there and stayed for three weeks. I was driving back. And I had Debbie and Ashley with me. So... Uh, Ray booked us a room, so I went to check in, and I look, and there's Bill Dance at the desk, checking into his hotel room. And I looked at him, and he looked at me, and our eyes met, and I'd never met him before. He said, Palm Balls? And I just about melted right there. Bill Dance knows who I am? I said, yeah, Bob Lusk. He says, oh my gosh. He said, I'm so glad to meet you. He made me feel like I was a freaking superstar, and I'm not. You know, I'm just a dead gum fish guy. 
you know, from Texas. And he came over and made such a big deal, and we talked, and uh, we just became friends. He says, hey, man, next time you're around Memphis, come see me. So, I don't know, it's probably seven or eight months later, uh, and we got to sit down and talk, just chit-chat for a little bit, and I just loved listening to him, you know, because he owns his own lake. He's got two lakes, actually. He's got one that's 50 acres, and the other one's about six acres, right beside his house in Collierville, Tennessee. And so, uh, I don't know, it's a few months later, I called him, and I was headed over that way, and he says, hey, yeah, come by, I'll, I'll be there, let's let's visit. So I went to his office, and this is really pretty funny. Now, everybody that uh, pays attention to him knows he's got these video bloopers out there, and they're hilarious, you know. Well, in his office, his, his niece is the receptionist. Uh, one of his sons works there, I know, and then he's got this team of folks, from videographers to editors to marketing people, etc. And uh, when I went in, he brought me back to his office, and we just talked. And so he said, I, I've got a question for you. So I said, okay. Um, he said, do you ever put any any habitat structure when you're designing a lake? Do you ever put any in the middle of a lake? And I said, Bill, I really don't. I, I usually put it all around the edges because I, I see that as the, the littoral zone where all the productivity is going on. Out in the open water, there's really not a lot of productivity going on out there. He said, you know what? He said, I, I love to fish. And he said, I love to fish the Mississippi River for catfish. I love to fish, um, oh, I can't think of the name. There's a lake up that was formed when the earthquake hit in the 1800s, 1850s. Uh, real foot. He said, I love to fish real foot for crappie. He says, but I love to go to Kentucky Lake. And when I go to Kentucky Lake, he said, I'm looking on my graph, and when I find an underwater hump, I just start fan casting around that hump. And when I figure out that the top of the hump is right above the thermocline, he says, I can usually start getting some hits. And when I fan cast, it's trying to figure out if the fish are going to hit. And then I'll switch baits. And when I finally find the right bait at the right depth on that hump, he said, I'm going to be catching some fish. Do you ever do anything like that? And I said, no, I really don't. He says, you should. He says, because here's what happens. And he was dead on right. He said, "This in the summertime, he said, those fish are going to go away from the shoreline, get out in deeper water where they can move vertically to, to find their, and he didn't use this term. I'm going to use it. If they can find their thermal refuge. And he, he, was, he, he didn't say it that way, but that's what he was talking about. So the fish, if they've got some kind of structure, they can move up and down, and that underwater hump offers that kind of structure. So after he told me that, I started designing structure in some of these, these bigger lakes that I designed just so we can have that kind of thermal structure and cover away from the shoreline out toward the deeper part of the water. Then he asked me one more question. He said, um... In my 50 acre lake out west or east of town, he said, I'm not catching as many big bass as I used to. He said, uh, So I said, Well, are you calling any bass? Because typically, when a bass lake gets overcrowded, you get a handful of fish that get big, but then they age out and there's no fish coming up the pipe because they're all stunted. You know, they're overcrowded. So I said, Well, do you, uh, do you, do you call any fish? He said, Oh, yeah. He said, we started off calling 10 to 14 inch bass. <clears throat> he said, then our biologist told us to call 16 to 18 inch bass. He said, now we're calling all, every four pound bass we can catch, we're calling. So I leaned across his desk and I said, Bill, I'm going to tell you something I did not learn at Texas A&M University. I did not learn this at any Bass 101 meetings or schools. A four pound bass can't get to eight pounds. Now listen to me in a skillet and he died laughing he says can i use it on my show i said yeah yeah but it, think about it is a four pound bass a boy or a girl he said it's a female all all of them in my leg i said that's right so if you're calling four pound females you're actually taking the fish that are your junior varsity that have a legitimate shot to get up to those bigger sizes so what you've been doing is you've been taking that jv team and cutting them so you need to quit that and so it was pretty fun having those conversations, and I've had a number of conversations with him later uh, since then, and one of them is the temperature that fish quit biting. Christopher Aguilar, my pond water is at the lowest level since it was initially filled. Well, I totally get that, and I don't know what to do about it. You know, do a rain dance, but if you don't have a well, and you don't have a, 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 a method, then you need to be bracing yourself for what could happen and get ready to mitigate it. 
You know, and when I say that, it's really easy for me to sit here and say that, but, you know, happy water is water that's able to dispel its gases, manage its nutrient load, and move. But I'm telling you, don't aerate. If, if you don't have an aeration system, don't aerate. But what you can do is go buy a $1,500 uh, circulator and move it horizontally. So look at Casco Marine's website. They've got these circulators that you can plug in, hardwire, whatever, that are, is actually kind of like an underwater fan with a float on it, and you can anchor it, hold it so it doesn't take off like a boat. It's got a propeller. So that propeller kicks on and moves the water horizontally, creates kind of like a river system. You know, that's, that's a good way to deal with hot water right now is keep it moving. Because as the temperature goes up, like I've said twice already, its affinity for oxygen drops. So that means it, it, it may be saturated at 75%, which could be six parts per million. So you don't want that water to lose all of its oxygen simply because it's hot and there's a plankton bloom. So if you could move it horizontally or even diagonally at like a 20 degree angle, that would be fine. So how does pond depth, Justin Ludwig says, how does pond depth affect water temperature? Say a pond average is 10 feet deep. Every pond that isn't aerated is gonna stratify. And typically, ponds stratify halfway down. So like Lake Texoma, where, it, where it's got a lot of 90 foot water, the thermocline is gonna sit at 45 feet. That means the water from 45 feet to the surface is gonna be warm. Now the water at the thermocline is going to likely be 8 or 10 degrees cooler, maybe 10 degrees cooler than the water at the very surface. Now keep in mind that as water temperature warms, it expands and it floats. So 92 degree water is a lot more buoyant than 85 degree water, which is more buoyant than 75 degree water. So as water gets cooler, it's denser and it's heavier. And that's part of the reason I'm telling you don't go buy an aeration system and plug it in right now if if you don't have one going on already. So uh, how does pond depth affect the temperature? Um, when that when that thermocline's halfway down, deeper water has a tendency to harbor cooler water. But the problem with deeper water is let's say you got 20 feet of water and your thermocline sits at nine or ten feet that water below 9 or 10 feet is going to be totally devoid of oxygen. And if we do get one of these August snaps where a, a front blows down off the Rocky Mountains and you get a heavy rain with a little bit of hail and it cools this water down to this temperature and those two mix, you're set up for a fish kill in deeper water. So we're in a kind of a catch-22. So, But here's the deal. Deeper water is better right now than shallow water when you have these evaporation rates. That's why I tell guys like um, the uh, folks out around Abilene, Texas, Western Oklahoma, Western Kansas, if you know wh where you are, where rainfall is less annually, you need depth. You know, the farther east you go, you don't need as much depth because you don't need the storage capacity. But when we get into this kind of drought, storage capacity does make a difference. So I'm kind of talking in a circle. Here's the answer. A pond that averages 10 feet in deep depth means that your thermocline is probably going to be sitting at 7, 8 feet because you're going to have some 16 to 20 foot depth. And below that depth, the water's cool. The thermocline is cool. Water below the thermocline has zero oxygen in it right now. So the fish can at least go down 10 feet, hang out, breathe okay, and what's really funny is fish, they care a little bit less about how much oxygen they've got than what the temperature is. As long as there's enough oxygen to breathe or they don't die, they're pretty content with it. Okay, Dwight Lee, I see this. I'm guessing that you could employ the same tactic for the outfall of the spring pipe for your main drainage pipe. Yes, you can. As 45-ing your drainage pipe down into your pond to draw outflow from the bottom instead of using a double wall standpipe. Those, those two things serve the same purpose. They serve the, serve the exact same purpose. So basically you're trying to, to, to get rid of some of that anoxic cold water off the bottom 
when you're replacing it with cool spring water coming in at that flow rate. So both of those have the same effect. It might be easier just to do that overflow pipe, you know, if you're going to do it from scratch. Clean line painting. Will my dogs die if they get into the pond with blue-green algae? That is an absolute risk. So I had a guy, This th these kind of things irritate me a little bit, but I had a guy message me on Facebook last week. And he sent me a picture, and it showed blue-green algae floating dead on top of the pond. He said, if I let my dog swim in this, will they die? Well, I can't answer that. How do I know? My answer was, I would not let my dog swim in it. He said, well, I let my dog swim in it, and they didn't die. Why in the hell are you asking me the question? So then I was very tactful, and I responded. I said, if I saw blue-green algae floating on top of a pond, I would not let my dog swim in it. Now, if you want to dig into the science of it, you can have a sample sent off, have it evaluated, do an algae count, and then you can decide what to do about it. But if I see any, you know, any mass of blue-green algae dead floating on the pond, I am not, I am so deeply in love with my dog, I am not going to let her swim. Now, she ain't going to do it anyway because she's, she's a lap dog. She don't care about it, which is fine with me. But I'm going to tell you this, Lauren, Ashley, Meza, I wouldn't risk it. Not worth it. Because if they don't, you got lucky. If they do... You're going to wish they didn't. Harrison Davis. Good to see you, buddy. Yep. Um, let's see here. Danny Mack. It is indeed, and I got a surprise with my three-foot deep temperature gauge at 87 and a half after the aerators fired up about 9 p.m. I believe that represents surface water pushed by the aerator against the vertical wall. It soon dropped back to normal. Normal being 83 degrees, as I recall. I've never seen your pond, and I got some of you memorized, dude. What's up with that? During the day, aerator's off. I'm running a surface fountain in my pumped creek with seven waterfalls counting on evaporative cooler. What do you make of that? Am I wrong? No. I tell you what. I tell you how to know if you're wrong. Check the temperature. <laughs> and you know what? You're a scientist. Dude, you're, you're a nuclear stud, dude. You're a physicist. You know this stuff. So I'm not picking on you, but I'm just going to be Captain Obvious. I'm not going to tell you you're wrong. Check the temperature. That temperature will tell you. Hello, Michael Eric. Good to see you. Justin Lugwood doesn't fish in extreme heat. Ardawan, Ardawan, Boudan, Ardwan, 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 Ardawan, Wan, Wan, Ardwan, Boudan. 88 acres. Oh, 88. Okay. Made me spit my <laughs> Chico. Well, R.E. Thompson, this guy, he got, he's got old. I mean, he's he don't have any wrinkles or nothing, but. The guy rides a motorcycle, he fishes all the time, he manages ponds, he mows yards, and he, and, and he, and he works charity work. That's his full-time job. I'm so jealous of that guy. I dang it, I just need to make, go to Mississippi just to meet him and watch him run circles around my 67-year-old obese butt. Okay, I'm going to bypass Stephen Martin's answer. He already did that. Richard Williams, how old is the six-inch catfish? I didn't stock my new pond with them, but I just saw them in Arago trying to figure out how they got in there. I watched your past episode about it, Half Acre Pond. Mike Cottrell, I was just um, kind of talking about you with the volume of rain and um, wildfires over where you are, as well as evaporation rates. So, Richard, a six-inch catfish. Kind of depends on the species of fish. If it's here we are, we're at the uh, middle of, toward the end of July. If it's six inches long, odds are high that it's a bullhead catfish. If it's a bullhead catfish, it can be a year, it could be two years old. If it's a channel catfish, it's not this year's hatch. If it's a blue cat, it's not this year's hatch. That means it's at least a year old, which is way, way, way under what it should be. So, I'm going to make an assumption that it's a bullhead catfish. Uh, and six inches should be about a year old. You know, bullheads, I don't remember where you are, but bullheads, we don't, you know, in the south, they're looked at looked at as trash fish, but in the north, they're on menus. You know, coming out of the winter, because over the winter, they absorb all their fat. You know, bullhead catfish are actually predator fish. 
uh, I, I have electrofished pound and a half bullheads that had six inch gizzard shed in their gut and small turtles and crawfish and bluegill you know just because they live in the mud which they do they'll stick their heads down in the mud and just lay there for hours and hours and hours that doesn't mean that they're necessarily just junk fish it's just they're they're looked as um trash fish especially in southern waters if that's what they are <clears throat> let's take a minute and do a little commercial hey some of you just joined in we got a pretty good crowd going on palm boss magazine 35 bucks a year cheaper than a friday night date and last a year that date's done in an hour and a half and i don't know what happens after your friday night dates but i don't know what happens to mine and this lasts longer chico just spit something out i know i, <laughs> I heard it i heard it hit the computer screen <laughs> go chico I'm a big fan of Purina Mills, um, and I'm biased. I'm an ambassador for them, but the reason I'm biased is I've been able to work with them since 1995, and I've watched how they operate. I've seen their research and development. I've used their feeds. I've grown giant fish. I'm a believer. You know, I know there's other feeds out there, but my hat hangs on Purina's wall because I've watched. I've grown bluegill over three pounds with that fish food. I've grown lots of bluegill. I'm not going to tell you you're going to grow three pound bluegill. Maybe you will, maybe you won't, but I know you can grow pound and a half and pound and three quarter bluegill, maybe two pound bluegill. I know you can grow feed trained bass. I know you can grow hybrid stripers. You know, I know you can grow forage fish. I know you can enhance the productivity of a pond using Purina's fish foods. They got a strong lineup, especially the for, uh, sport fish feeds. Now, one of the things you got to know about fish food is fish foods now a day nowadays are made uh, for specific species of fish and sizes of those fish. So, based on your goal and what you want to grow, you got a variety of feeds you can choose from. If you're going to grow like these catfish that Richard's talking about, feed those a grain-based fish food; they're going to grow fine. If you're going to grow giant bluegills, grain-based fish food, they'll eat it, but they're not going to grow. It's like kind of like you and me eating donuts compared to T-bone steak. You know, feed a fish meal based feed. Texas Hunter Feeders, I love those guys. Great products, even better uh, customer service. Anytime there's an issue with the feeder, they're on it. You know, and pour a little Purina feed and it takes us under feeder and it adds consistency, which is real important to feeding. Now, I'd be remiss if I didn't talk to you about feeding fish. In hot water, Fish that eat fish food, their metabolism rate slows down. Cut your feed back. You know, even if they're eating it, cut it back a little bit. Wait till the water temperature mitigates a little bit, then ramp up. Because they're gaining a lot, they'll gain a lot more weight once the water temperature gets down into the upper 70s, all the way down into the low 60s. So right now, for the sake of not distressing your water chemistry and not distressing the fish, cut the feed back a little bit. Okay, Adam Harkness, should Casco service aer aerators be shut down during the day like bottom? No. No, Adam, the way I see that, that's the reason I'm talking about those surface aerators. The surface aerators are, there's two kinds of surface aerators, what Adam's talking about. One of them looks like a, a churning little volcano-shaped fountain that's picking water up maybe from 18 inches or two feet down and circulating it kind of like a mushroom. Just picture a, a volcano mushroom-shaped shaped round plume of water that's that's moving like this the other uh, water movers are fans that move water in a straight line current now when that straight line current moves it's going to go to to whatever the obstruction is the shoreline or whatever and it's going to turn and come right back to you so you've got a horizontal circulation over a longer distance with those underwater movers than you would with some of these surface aerators Tim Deals, Salisbury, North Cagalac, a couple of weeks ago I mistakenly asked if aerator would increase oxygen. I meant to ask what a fountain increase oxygen. Um, what a fountain does... Oh, Chico, I'm trying to figure out what you're talking about. O2 versus... Oh, okay, I got it, I got it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, o oxygen, dissolved oxygen versus comfort. Chico, that's exactly right. You know, it's, it's more important for a fish to seek a better temperature zone than it is for that same fish to have more than it needs to breathe 
As long as you got enough to breathe, it's going to do fine. So Tim Deal, a fountain, um, I think the best way to answer that is a fountain typically drafts shallow. So it's, and, and here, here's the way to answer that. When that fountain spits water up into the air and breaks it up into smaller droplets, those droplets are more likely to absorb oxygen from the atmosphere than if the atmosphere just contacted the surface. So the answer is yes, the, the water coming out from a fountain is going to absorb more oxygen and it's going to relieve itself of, of, of gases that it doesn't need. You know, like hydrogen sulfide, whatever, whatever's in that upper layer of water. <clears throat> now, it's a balancing effect. It's not necessarily going to create a greater amount of dissolved oxygen over the entire pond. Because once that water that absorbs that oxygen comes back down and hits the water surface, it's going to dissipate that oxygen. So it kind of depends on the consumption rate. If you've got a blue-green algae bloom, that oxygen is going to be absorbed really quick. If the pond is shallow, a lot of that oxygen is going to be absorbed pretty quick. I just hit the cord. I got plugged in. <coughs> and so uh, uh, the downside to, an, to, to a fountain is that when it is going in the heat, your um, uh, uh, evaporation rate goes up. So the more that air contacts that water to warm it up, the more likely that air is to absorb that water. So you'll see, you'll actually literally watch your water go down faster when you're on a fountain than if you don't. Jeb Kaufman, feeding during these hot temps, stop amount times. You know, uh, rather than to, to kind of I'm going to keep this uncomplicated. The fish are still going to eat. Now, I'd rather see you feed them during the coolest part of the day, which is going to be, you know, from 5.30 in the morning until probably 9 o'clock. I'd rather, them, I'd rather see the fish be fed then. That's also when your oxygen levels are going to be the lowest. But if the fish come up and eat that fish food, feed it to them. Just don't overfeed. Cut it. Now, I would cut it back. You're not going to lose anything. If you're feeding two pounds a day and you cut it back to half a pound, you're not going to lose a lot of weight gain. Because if the fish don't have to come and eat, they're not spending the energy to come get it, coming up into that stressful part of the pond, and they're going to sit down where they belong, you know. But that, but as long as they get just a little nutrition so they don't lose any weight, then they're going to be good. So, um, I would not stop feeding. I would feed whatever they'll clean up within a minute. Best time to do it is 7 o'clock in the morning or about an hour to an hour and a half after the sun comes up. Steve Scanlon. Hello, Steve. Good to see you, buddy. I have a well line running to my pond. What are some of the best practices? I've been using it sparingly when I see it evaporating fast. Pond is aerated eight feet deep, a little less than one and a quarter acre in Peaster. Peaster is not far from Weatherford, America. Um, I would run the well. Now, here's the, here's the thing everybody's got to know about a well. All water well temperatures right now are cooler than pond temperatures. That's a good thing. Water wells, when they're cranking that water out, come through that pipe, crystal clear, beautiful water, has no oxygen in it. So I think it's best to allow that water to run over some cobble or even if you just run it over a piece of corrugated metal, as long as it can be spread out before it hits the pond. Because if you think about it, we talked about density earlier. Warm water is not dense, cool water is. So that water coming out of the well is based fundamentally this time of year cold. So even if it's 80 degrees, it's still colder than the surface water. So when that well water hits, it's more dense, it's gonna have a tendency to migrate down. And everybody knows, we, we preach this all the time, what, what puts oxygen in water? Come on, I'll sing it. Come on, you're a choir. Sing it to me. Photosynthesis from plants and contact with the Yep, Chico's barking and I hear him. Atmosphere. You know, so when that well water goes in and it goes straight down, it's not going to communicate with the atmosphere and it's not going to have the benefit of uh, photosynthesis from aquatic plants or algae or plankton or whatever. So if you can run it 
into the pond over something that can break it up and allow that water to spread out so it can absorb some oxygen as it comes into the pond it's going to be more effective for you let's see what scott says here i thought i heard 87 degrees as temperature bass begin survival mode um no it's not when they begin it it's when they're peaking out they're, they actually begin survival mode at 83. By the time it gets to 87, it's getting close to fatal. You know, they're, 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 uh, if they were a dog, they'd be panting at 85. 87, they'd be laying in the shade wanting water. You know, so <clears throat> my 550 acre community lake is about 87, 88 degrees. Is it 87 or 88 degrees from top to bottom? I doubt that it is. Uh, should I strongly urge the club members to cancel their tournaments this week? Seems like putting bass in live well is going to kill a bunch of good bass. That is very likely to happen. Mortality rates this time of year in hot water where they're pumping water into live wells, that is going to be significant enough that you're going to see mortality rates escalate. So if they want to have a paper tournament, figure out how to do that, I think that would be okay. Although, although I don't think they need to be catching fish and holding them this time of year with this excessive heat especially in missouri you know uh anywhere where the water if the water temperature is 87 or 88 fish will die now i'm going to tell you 100 percent are going to die because they probably won't but enough of them are going to die that people are going to see fish floating and the community is going to be a little upset about that hello chuck brinkman hope those girls are doing good which i know they are danny mac check the temperature <laughs> It wasn't my goal to throw you under the under the bus or throw you under the water or throw you under the stick-ups, but here we go. Harrison Davis, how would I tell if a pond I'm caring for that has an olive brown appearance is from zooplankton or soil or organic turbidity? The best way to tell that is to have a sample of that, uh, preserve it, and send it to my friend Bill Cody. If, and, and, and if you want to do that, he charges like 40 bucks, 50 bucks, something like that. And he, he wants like a medicine bottle full of water, preserved with betadine, shipped to him within two days, and he'll look at it and he'll tell you. He'll tell you whether it's, you know, whether it's um, uh, plankton, whether it's detritus, whether it's uh, what uh, diatomaceous earth. And he sees a lot of that this time of year. So he could figure that out if you want to send a sample to him, but you... But if you do, send me an email and I'll, I'll, I'll copy him and respond to it and he can coach you up on how to do that. And that same thing if anybody wants to uh, see what their blue-green algae blooms look like. He's really good at that. And he sits in front of a computer and a, and a dead gun microscope all day every day. Mike Cottrell. Going to Palapena County. You're south of the Big fires of Possum Kingdom burning houses down. Yep, it's supposed to be some rain, but it's like 30% coverage sneaking down off of the tail end of the jet stream. Okay, uh, Adam said, I finally tried MVP a couple months ago, and by far better than the competitors. It really is a good feed. Chico has, he said, Trent has a real research pond in an amazing facility. Yes, he's exactly right. Hey, Jennifer. Jennifer Ardwan. Ooh, I said it right. Pat me on the back, Ron. It's your beautiful bride right there. Good to see you, honey. Um, I'm proud of your husband. That guy's doing a great job. Ron is Lake Area Pond Management Company, Lake Charles, Louisiana. And I got to tell a story about Ron. He, he started calling me and texting me, emailing me. I don't know. I don't even know how he found me. Probably watching these shows, but... but I don't know, four or five years ago, started uh, asking me questions. And typically, typically, look at there, there's Trey Carpenter, wildlife biologist, retired pond management superstar over there in uh, uh, around Lake Buchanan, Burnett, Texas. So anyway, Ron started asking questions, and I remember there were times I would just kind of laugh about it, thinking, you know, this guy's really asking some cool questions. And most of the time, 99 times out of 100, when somebody starts asking me questions, I will have them invest. Whether it's, whether it's, I'll answer some questions and then I'll ask them a bunch of questions. If they answer them, then I'll answer the next line. Or buy a subscription to Palm Boss. I mean, damn, I've been doing this forever. This knowledge ain't cheap. I paid for it. 
in more more ways than one. But I loved the way Ron's demeanor was, his countenance, how he handled himself. And for some reason, I kept answering his questions and then engaging in conversations. Then he wanted to talk. Well, I am all over talking to people on the phone when I'm driving my truck. You know, when I'm going down the highway, I'm not writing. I'm not working on reports. I'm not, you know, taking care of grandkids. I'm not working in a shocker boat, whatever. So I love to talk. And I was just drawn to Ron's uh, way of thinking. And I knew, even though he's got a full-time job working at a refinery, where he works, I think, a week on, a week off, and he wanted to build a pond management company. So I thought, you know what? I, I, this is cool. I'm going to do this. And uh, he sent me a big bundle of boudin one time, which we ate on that for about four months. <laughs> but I just knew there was something special about Ron. And now here he is. He's got his pond management company up and going. He's got some great clients. He's gaining confidence. He's gaining a, turning it into a business. And I'm really, really proud of him for that. Yep. All right. So now let's see. Uh, Mike Cook. Let me make sure I didn't miss anything here. Let me back up. Ron's been subscribing since 2007. Damn. I didn't even know you were that old. All right, Harrison can buy a cheap microscope like Ron did. Just send it to Ron let him do it. <laughs> okay, uh, 2007, dude. I don't, now, now I know how you found me. Mike Cook, you're welcome, Harrison Davis. Hey, Bob, summer camp's keeping us busy. He's in North Carolina, Boy Scout camp up there. Feeding Aquamax starter, fish are growing. That's a good, good call. There's going to be, in the upcoming issue of Pond Boss, I just finished, actually, I'm ahead. The July-August is in the mail stream. People are getting it right now. And I'm, I've just knocked out the September-October issue, about three weeks ahead of schedule, which never happens. But there's going to be a really, really interesting article in there about growing trophy bluegills. I called uh, Bruce Candelo and chatted with him about what he does. And then I kind of dug into what we've done at Richmond Mill Lake. And then with Ron Morgan, who's a client locally, and seven or eight different places where we've grown some legitimate state record bluegills, even though they don't care to, to register those for state records. But how do we do that? So I got an article coming up in what... Uh, I don't know who's putting that dead gum anger face up there. Take it off. I don't want you to do that. Um, so anyway, uh, one of the things that Bruce pointed out, and then we did this at Richmond Mill Lake, it's real important to feed the young fish the right size food. You know, so in the upcoming issue of Pond Boss, we're going to be talking about that. So if you haven't subscribed yet, please do. All right. Let's see uh, Danny Mack. All right, hanging out from Leon Springs. There used to be a guy at Leon Springs, Danny Mac, that was kind of an amateur aquaculturist, and his specialty was threadfin shad. He had like five little ponds out behind his house. I can't remember. There was a stream where he could pump water, and he would grow those threadfin shad, and oh my gosh, he did a great job. That was in like 82, 83, 84, 85, 86, right through there, maybe to 1990, and then he fell off the planet. I don't know what happened. He he had a few years on him, a little long in the tooth, so he might have just retired from it. So, hey, you know what? It's about that time. Uh, Palm Balls Magazine, 35 bucks a year, cheaper than a Friday night date, unless it's Ron Ardwan taking out his wife for dinner. It'll cost more. <laughs> so, because she deserves it. So, hey, listen, I appreciate you guys hanging out with me, as always. Uh, hanging out in the RV next month, uh, Wednesday. I'll be hanging out in Granberry at the house. The swimming pool is finished. Um, Uh-oh, Trevor Fry in the spring when it fertilizes. Does it matter how deep my lake is or is fertilization? Fertilization is all about surface acres. So there's my final answer. Phone a friend. Final answer. Yes, it's all about surface acres. So I will be in Granberry at home with a swimming pool with water in it, I hope, after one year. And uh, look forward to talking to you again. There's Matt Marsden with American Fish Tree. And uh, Harrison Davis, thank you, Palmos. Hey, thank you for watching this show. Because without you guys, what difference does it make? Nobody's watching it. Why do it? So uh, I deeply appreciate all of you for watching this show. And, uh, uh, you know, maybe we can hang out one of these days working on the next Institute of Higher Pondology. Don't have that finalized yet, but I will before long. 
So until next Wednesday night from Granbury, Texas, Pecan Plantation,